Hey, it's Dr. Bill with Raytown Christian Church. Thanks for joining us for worship today, and thanks for joining me for this conversation. Over the past several weeks, we've been talking about the, the, the question of what does it take to be good enough? What does it take to be good enough to be considered a person of faith in today's world? And because this is a season of Lent, we've been looking at the whole repentance piece and, and getting ready for Good Friday, which is the crucifixion of Jesus. And yeah, I know that, that what never makes much sense to me either. Why do you call Friday where Jesus was crucified a Good Friday, but good for us, not so good for him? Um, although he did become the savior of the world, so I guess that's still good, but eh, all right. Anyway, be as it may. In the season of Lent, we do a lot of self-reflection where we look at ourselves and our relationship um, with Jesus because Let's be honest, we had a part in putting him on that cross because he didn't sin, we did, do regularly, you get the picture. So during Lent, we reflect on that. And so specifically over the last several weeks and for a couple weeks more, we're talking about how do we get around the three major temptations that we all, that, that we all face? How do we deal with the the abuse of power. Not someone else's abuse of power on us, but how we abuse power. And you do, and I do. We all do. We abuse our power to get people to do the things we want them to do. By hook or by crook, by manipulation, by character assassination, by doing any of hundreds of things to get our own way in spite of what others may need or want. We're not very loving. And so how do we get over that temptation of of abusing our power. Then there's the, another temptation which is similar because that, that temptation is having priorities, setting our priorities over the priorities that God would set for us. We want our own way and we want it now. And that we, we set our priorities of our life you know, above God and we make other things into our God's whether it's a uh, consumerism or being young or whatever, we, we, we set our priorities above what God wants for us. And so, and when we, when we, we do that so we can, again, get what we want, which sometimes leads to the whole power thing and, and getting other people to do what we want. It's, it's this vicious circle. And the last of the temptation is the desire for praise from those around us to the point that we lie, um, we, we shade the truth, we do whatever we can to make ourselves look better. Um, sometimes people call that hypocrisy. Three huge temptations that we face every day of our lives. And so over the past several weeks, we've talked about how to get over those temptations. And last week we talked about how to stay on the narrow path of obedience. You know, Jesus said the path is narrow. And he talks about you know, that path is narrow because people aren't obedient. They don't obey the love God, love neighbor, and make disciples. Don't forget that last one. And make disciples passage. We, we think that if we're just you know, kind of okay, um, then, then that'll be enough. But Jesus says it's a narrow path and not very many people make it down that path. But when we're on that path, when we're being obedient, it was actually pretty difficult to fall in temptation because when you're being obedient, of course, temptation just kind of flies by because we're focused on doing what the Lord wants. So this week, I want to give you another tool, another tool to help you beat back this, though those three temptations and really every temptation because it's really difficult to fall in temptation when you're continually in God's presence. When you're walking with God moment by moment, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, it's, it's, it's not impossible to fall in temptation, but it's more and more difficult. And I want to read to you from the Psalms. I'm going to read Psalm 139. So if you have your Bible, and since you're online, I know that you can open another tab in your browser and you can go to YouVersion or a Bible Study Tools or Bible Gateway and turn with me, if you have your cell phone, um, turn with me to Psalm 139. We're going to read some selected verses. Psalm 139, we'll start with verse 1. All right, here goes. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit, you know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down, and you are familiar in all my ways. Skipping down to verse 13. For you created my inmost being. 
You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place in the womb. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All my days ordained for me were written in your book before a single one of them came to be. Powerful stuff. Over the years, I have recommended a book by a man named the Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God. And I've recommended that book a number of times over the last several years. And I really want to encourage you to consider getting it and reading it. In fact, at the end of this sermon, I'm going to almost insist on it because that's what I want you to do this week. I want you to get that book and read it because this psalm, it so sounds like that book. God isn't some deity who is out there somewhere. He's right here. That's number one on your handout. You see, God isn't out there. God wants to be very involved in your life. Not just involved in your life. God wants to be very involved in your life. Now, to be fair, that's not a really common perspective. It's not something that most people live and breathe and realize because it seems that so few have experienced that closeness that, that Brother Lawrence or, or the psalmist talks about, this, this presence where you, God just knows us when we're rising up and sitting down, when, when we go to bed, when we get up in the morning, when we're driving, whatever. God is with us and knows us and, and even knows our thoughts. I've often wondered as I read scriptures, why does the Bible show people having that kind of a close personal experience with God, and yet so often God feels so very far from me? You know, there's a time where Abraham bargained with God about the fate of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They're going at it head to head. Abraham is saying, listen, God wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham is saying, listen, God, if there's a hundred righteous people, would you really still destroy that city? And, and God's going, well, okay, if you can find a hundred people. And, well, well, Abraham says, how about 50? And, and it just goes on down. But there's this relationship where, where Abraham feels like he can argue with God and bargain with God. They're, they're on that kind of a relationship. Then there's Moses. And, and Moses and God have this conversation. And God encourages Moses about his public speaking abilities. Moses saying, I, I stutter. And God's saying, it's okay. We can get through this. And then there's the book of Job. And, and God argues with Job about the cause of the hardships that Job's going through. Job's shaking his fist at God. Hey, God, this isn't okay. And if I've done something wrong, I want to know what it is. And God goes, hey, let's have a conversation about this. Let, let me, let's talk about this. And then the psalm we just read, that's attributed to King David. And he's saying, God, you know me from the, from the very core of my being. You know my thoughts. You, you, you're with me all the time when I rise and sit down, when I go and whatever. All of these people seem to have this personal relationship with the God Almighty. The question I think we all need to wrestle with, at least what I wrestle with, is why don't we? So while I was studying and praying and wrestling with this message this week, I was, if you will, visited by two parables that Jesus told. The first is, they're both in Luke 15, and the first is the good shepherd and the lost sheep, and the second is the prodigal son. As I compared those two parables, and they're almost side by side, as I compared them, something came upon me that I'd never realized before, and that's what I want to share with you today. Now, if you were raised in Sunday school, if you've been in church all your life, you have probably heard, and you probably remember, the story of the good shepherd and the lost sheep. That story is that there's a shepherd, and he realizes one of his sheep is lost, and he goes out to find the sheep. 
And, and the sheep's out there. The sheep doesn't know what's lost. The sheep's just out there doing his thing. And the good shepherd goes and searches until he finds that sheep. And then when he does, he calls for a celebration because he's found the lost sheep. It, we're intentionally taught through that parable that God seeks us out and is out there to bring us back to him. But let's be real. That really doesn't seem to happen much, does it? We, we feel so far from God so much of the time that, that we kind of become used to it. You know, sometimes we feel it in church and you know, we come to worship and, and we feel it. Sometimes maybe we're in the car and we're playing Christian music and just something strikes us. Or, or we see a sunset or the ocean shore or the mountains. Something, you know, connects and we, and we feel God's presence. But most of the time, yeah. We come to worship looking for God and then waiting for God to come to us. Sometimes we get that glimpse, get the touch, but it doesn't last. It doesn't stay with us. And some of us worry and wonder why. Is somehow God not around? I think some of us explain it away. We're, we're content with the explanation that God is distant or, or too busy or, or too godlike, too almighty to bother with the likes of us. Besides, let's be honest, how, how could God be personally involved with over a billion Christians in the world, let alone me? I, that's just unfathomable. And yet deep down inside, let's be honest, we want that kind of experience. We want, we yearn for that kind of companionship. We want to realize that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, that, that God is besought with us. God loves us and, and wants to be in relationship to us and spend time with us. And that, that that God has taken a personal interest in my every day. We want that. In the Good Shepherd and the Lost Sheep parable, seems to promise that if we just wait around long enough, God's finally going to get around to finding us and, and we'll be in his presence again. And if he doesn't, then probably we've just misunderstood God's relationship with the world. That God really is too busy for the likes of us. We'd like it, but maybe God's not like that. Now, like I said, in Luke 15... There are a number of lost parables, if you will, lost parables. There's a lost sheep, and there's, there's a lost coin, and both of those, the, 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 the shepherd, in the second case, a woman goes and searches everywhere, one for the sheep, one for the coin, until they find them. And then there's the prodigal son. The prodigal son. Now, you probably know this. I would presume you know this. If, if you've been in church for more than a year, You've heard this story at least once and maybe several times, and there's been paintings about it and stories about it, but here's just the nutshell of what it is. The prodigal son, is, it's, it's the dad and two sons, and dad is pretty well off, and the youngest son uh, comes to dad, maybe when he's 18, and he says, dad, listen, just give me my inheritance now, and you won't have to worry about it, and I can go live my life because I don't, I don't want to live on the farm where you live, on this ranch, farm, whatever. I don't want to be here. I want to go do my own thing. I want to see the world. And for whatever reason, the dad says, okay. And he gives the son you know, a check and sends him out. And the son heads on down the road and goes you know, to see the world, literally, and he squanders the money. And we're told he squanders the money on wine and women and song. I mean, he goes out and just has a really good time, but he blows through the money. And he's out there in the middle of nowhere, you know, miles and miles from home, many miles from home, in a, in a foreign land. And the only job he can find is slopping the hogs, being with the pigs, which would be totally abhorrent to a Jewish kid. It's just like pigs and, you know, pork and, and Jews, they don't do this thing, you know. So, so, I mean, he's really desperate, but he takes his job. And, and we're told that, that it, it, it doesn't pay much, apparently, and, and he's even envious of the slop that he's given the, the hogs and sometimes, you know, borrows some of their food. 
And then he realizes, comes to his senses, if you will, and says, you know, my dad's servants, they're well fed, they're cared for, they have good clothing, they, they have, my dad takes care of them. He says, so I'm going to go back. I'm going to throw myself at the mercy of my father and just ask him to take me as a slave. I'll, I'll be one of his indentured servants and at least I won't be here. And so he makes his way home. His father, who's been watching for him, sees him, and they, there's this big reunion and the big party, which the elder brother gets really ticked off about. That's another story. But the, the, the family is reunited, and, and the son you know, lives happily ever after, so, so to speak. And the dad doesn't just uh, let him be a servant. He makes him his son again. Probably a poor son, but nonetheless, he becomes a son. He gives him the family a cloak and puts a ring on his finger, and all is wonderful. Now, we tend to think the prodigal son and the good shepherd and the lost sheep is saying the same thing, that God will seek us out so that we can have that personal relationship, that God loves us so much that he's going to come hunting for us. But there's a huge difference between the lost sheep parable and the prodigal son parable. In the lost sheep, the sheep is lost. It's not of the fold, it's not in the fold, it's not, if you will, one of us. In the context of the passage, Jesus is saying to the religious leader that God is interested in seeking and finding those who are not a part of the kingdom of God, those who are lost, those who don't even know they're lost. That sheep was just out munching away and wandered away and kept going and kept wandering and and disappeared. And and the, the sheep didn't know he was lost. The sheep was just being a sheep. Number two on your handout, the lost sheep is a lost sheep. You may want to put that second lost in call capitals. He's lost, doesn't know he's lost. He's out there. He's separate. And what happens? God does seek the lost. God does draw them to him. Now, God doesn't draw them to the church, and God doesn't do the sale, so to speak. God you, through the Holy Spirit, helps make hearts ready for us, those who are the shepherds, if you will. We're there to go out to them and to take the good news to them. But God prepares them, drawing them to him, to be in their presence so they can feel the presence of God. So they, go, they know what they're missing. But the prodigal son, that's a very different story. You see, the son isn't lost. The the key word there, he's a son. He's a willful, prideful, lustful, foolish son. But number three on your handout, the prodigal son is still a son. He's a son. He's one of us. He's, He's one of God's. He's one of God's chosen. The son, though, leaves the presence of the father. The son willfully leaves, wanders away, not like the sheep, He intentionally, give me my bucks, I'm out of here. He walks away, he's willful about it. And what does the father do? The father waits. He doesn't go and look for him. He doesn't go out, you know, to to find the son. Instead, he stays home and he hopes and he waits and he looks for the son, probably prays for the son, but he doesn't chase after the son. The son is an adult. He's a big boy. He's made a choice. That's how it is. You make the choice. You live with the choices. In the first parable, the lost sheep is lost and doesn't know it. In the second parable, the prodigal son willfully leaves. And that's when the light began to dawn on me as I was working through these two stories. And and that old bumper sticker theology you may remember, it says, if God seems far away, who moved? I never liked that theology. But you know, I've learned over the years that just because I don't like something doesn't mean it's not true. And I realized something. That God still seeks the lost, but once they're found, the quality of the relationship depends on us. Let me say that again. And I'd like you to write this down. God still seeks the lost. God's still looking for the lost. But once found, the quality of the relationship depends on us. That quality of relationship between us and God, it depends on us. God doesn't force himself on us. That means 
if you're a follower of Jesus, and if you want the kind of relationship that God had with King David and Moses and Abraham and Job and so many people in the scriptures, if you want that kind of relationship with God, that kind of relationship that Christmas talks about, you know, Emmanuel, God with us, if you want that kind of relationship that Jesus promised to his followers, we called, his, called them friends, and promise them a full and abundant life, then it's up to you and it's up to me to nurture that relationship. The question really is, do you want that kind of relationship? Because I don't think everyone does. Do you want the kind of relationship where you're increasingly aware of God's presence in your day-to-day life? Because if you want that kind of relationship, you can have it. But like the prodigal son, You have to take responsibility for getting back into the presence of God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you call us into your presence. You call us as sons and daughters. You long to envelop us in your love, to give us and be in our presence and us in your presence. But Lord, you're always here, whether we're aware of it or not. You're available. You want to be involved. But Lord, it's so easy for us to just ignore you, to turn you away, to be like the prodigal son and walk away and just pretend that that relationship is something else. Lord, help us to know your presence. Help us to yearn for spending time with you and knowing you're walking with us, your care, your love, knowing that you are besought with us, that you love us. You love us enough that you died for us. Help us to love you enough to want to be in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's the deal. When you're in God's presence, it becomes difficult to succumb to temptation. Now, don't get me wrong, it's still possible. But it's a lot more difficult when you are in God's presence and you know you're in God's presence all the time. The question is, (laughs) how do you get into that presence? And Brother Lawrence He says that you get there by practice. You have to practice the presence of God. And so I have two things to to give to you this week. First, I want you to read that book. It's by Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. It's the practice of the presence of God. And you can find it online. Amazon.com has it. And and it's very inexpensive. It's a very thin book and it's very easy read. You can also find it online. Um, it, it's old enough that it's of the public domain. The, and so you can find it there for free. But the ones that are for sale on Amazon.com are more current translations because it was written in French. And the more current translations are more in today's language and it'd be so much easier to read. But one way or the other, I want you to read that book this week. Get the practice of the presence of God and read that book. Because this is an instruction manual on how to practice that presence, on how to be in that presence, to how to feel the presence of God moment by moment and day by day. And number two, you get into the presence of God by practicing what I call conversational prayer. That's Paul's uh, command to pray without ceasing that he gave to the Thessalonians. Pray without ceasing, never stop ceasing prayer. But that, that kind of prayer isn't, dear God, I come to you today, now that, that, that's a prayer, but that's more of a monologue kind of prayer. It's me talking to God. Conversational prayer is like being with a friend, like doing laundry together. What do you, what do you talk about when you're with a friend if you're doing laundry together? Just if, if Jesus was there watching, talking with you, what would you say? Hey, Jesus, does this red sock go in the whites? No, you don't think so? Okay. You know, whatever it is, uh, practice conversational prayer. And again, Brother Lawrence's book, The Practice of the Presence of God, talks about that and how you can have that. So that's really what I want to encourage you 
beseech you to do this week because it'll help you be in that presence if that's what you want. Come to the time where we're wrapping this up. We're going to share communion together, the bread and the cup. I hope you have uh, both bread and cup so you can share with us. Um, and following that, we're going to get together in the virtual cafe and we can talk about your experience of the presence of God. And maybe you have some tools to share with others to tell us all how we can experience God's presence day by day, moment by moment. Let's break the bread, let's share the cup, and I'll see you in the cafe.